Good morning, and a very warm welcome to the first plenary learning lab on the political economy of agri-nutrition. My name is Scott Drimmy. I'm at Stellenbosch University, and I work with an organization called the Southern Africa Food Lab. Um, we deal a great deal with political economy issues, both in terms of concepts, but also in terms of application. So a little while ago, the Agricultural Health Nutrition Academy were challenged in terms of how they were grappling with issues of power and political economy. It became something that perhaps was implicit in a lot of the discussions and the debates. Perhaps you could find some of the analysis in the post presentations and in the plenary debates. But Fiorelli Piccioni from Greenwich University spoke to Joe Yates and Sunita Kariala and questioned, is it not possible to establish a working group that could draw some of the best thinking globally into a paper that could be circulated within a &H, perhaps take a life of its alone in terms of broader scholarship, and really begin to push scholarship within the ANH to center power and political economy. And this group then was constituted with a small advisory group, Bill Mosley, Zodzi, um, Sikata, and myself, and worked over the last year or so in terms of developing what I think is a very, very fine paper. And we've got the privilege of engaging with some of it today with um, the working group that sits alongside myself. Before I introduce them, there is a description in terms of the, um, the, the, the document that we've got from, the, from the, the Academy Week. But in essence, it's about foregrounding power as a key lens through which to understand agri-food systems, the structuring of food environments, and the resulting nutrition outcomes. In essence, they're asking, what is it that we're doing if we don't, in fact, foreground power? What are the unintended consequences that emerge if power relations are not adequately understood and taken into account? And so, by placing ourselves, I think, in a very personal way in terms of what we're about to hear, the real resonance of this particular presentation, I think, will become clear. So the way we're going to work is that for 40 minutes or so, the four speakers from the working group will present to us, and then we will open it up in terms of a plenary discussion through question and answer, drawing in the in-person audience, but also I've got access to questions that will come online. And we will try and stimulate a discussion and a debate, and then we will wrap it up um, in terms of closing it before tea. In terms of the speakers, we'll go in the order of Bajoa Yeboe Biawong on my left. She's a research fellow at the Center for Social Policy Studies at the University of Ghana. Sara Stevano is a senior lecturer in economics at SOAS in the University of London. We'll be followed by Sierra Vercello, who is the assistant professor of food studies at the University of Toronto. And finally, Busiso Moyo, who's a researcher on the right to food um, at the University of Western Cape previously, but certainly an activist that is very prevalent and prominent at Johannesburg and more broadly. So it's my privilege to hand over to Joa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott, for the introduction. And um, thank you, everyone, for the opportunity. So my name is Ajoa again, and um, I'm, I'm happy to um, start the presentation. As a background, um, I'm sure that most of us here who, who are studying food, nutrition, are aware of the triple bedding of, of, of malnutrition. And I think that if you look at the global scope, you realize that in the um, developing countries and um, let's say sub-Saharan Africa, the prevalence of malnutrition is very high. And here we are talking about undernutrition, micronutrient deficiency, as well as overnutrition. Um, and because of that, um, a lot of the policies and interventions that are coming up have been looking very much into um, issues around improving nutrition. Um, and the role of agriculture in nutrition, I think we all know it's, it's very um, it's obvious. However, the linkage between how agriculture is supposed to contribute to nutrition remains contested. And while you realize that um, in terms of the debate and in terms of the approaches, most of them remain very technical. And in as much as we, we, um, 
we do not disregard the role of science and technology and, and all these technical approaches to improving food security and nutrition. We, you also realize that issues of power remains very, very, very um, limited in most of the, the research that um, it's available. So the dominant narrative really has to do with when you're looking at the, the, the linkage between agriculture and nutrition has really been improving productivity and um, giving attention to specific nutrients, right? But then you, 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 you realize that issues of power remains very, very limited. And if you're looking at power, not just, um, not just at, the, at the macro level, but also power at the micro level. So you're looking at power at the household level and then power in terms of the role that corporations play in, in determining what kind, what kind of narratives and what kinds of um, approaches are really um, promoted. So when you're talking about power, um, there are several ways to look at it. And um, there's the, the, the box on, on the green really helps us to understand it. And at the macro level, we are looking at instrumental power, um, structural power, and also discursive power. And in as much as they are not necessarily you know, neatly divided, this helps us to think through it when you're looking at the macro level um, analysis of power. And so um, this framework that we adopted from Clapital, instrumental power, we are looking at the direct control that corporations have um, in, in determining and influencing food choices. So here we are looking at issues around technology, issues around finance, um, even access to information, and how all of these drive the, the, the kind of um, um, food policies and that, that really um, shape um, food systems in, 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 on the continent and also mostly in, in developing countries. Um, um, when it comes to structural power, structural power, we are looking more at the, the material control over resources and, and the control over um, usually finance and capital. And um, in relation to this, you realize that over the years, a lot of big corporations are forming mergers and takeovers and doing so, they are able to really control and shape public policies, not only at the international level, but even also on other, other national levels in, in, in many countries. And all of these also um, really influence. And many a times they are also setting the rules. They are setting the rules and shaping public policies in, in, in countries. And then the last that um, you look at is discursive power. That is the communicative practices, right? So here we are looking at the campaigns, the advertisement, the way in which um, particular, um, let's say food, not necessarily food, but also the, the, the way in which these campaigns and advertisement sometimes more or less um, present even local food systems, sometimes even the traditional foods that people eat as, and even traditional agricultural practices as backwards. So, and it might not be direct, sometimes it's really like a very indirect ways in which um, these kind of advertisements and um, 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 media practices also shape the, the, food, the, the, the food choices of, 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 um, of individuals. So here we are saying that the choices that people make are not made in vacuum, it's, it's not a neutral space. And it's, it's very easy to present it as people have their own liberal choices in what they want. But behind the scenes, a, a, lot, a lot of these communicative practices are also really influencing these kind of um, um, food choices that people have. So, um, you, you, for example, you see some of these anti-obesity campaigns where you see, you know, hot, um, these sodas and beverages are really promoting the low calories. And you ask yourself, for example, what is, is it really what, what makes them a nutritious food, right? So people might think that it's okay to take some sodas because they are low, cal low calories, they are low sugar content. But then... We are not saying that it's not right, but what, what we are saying is that it's, it's influencing the way people make their choices.
And then we are, if we move away from the macro level to the micro level, we're also looking at power, especially at the household level. So we have many agri-nutrition interventions that are really aiming as, at um, improving livelihoods and improving nutrition. But then you ask yourself, how, how is this exacerbating you know, inequality and the burden? Usually you're looking at gendered roles, for example, in, in, in the household. We are looking at um, how this shapes, um, you're, you're looking at even the preparation of food, for example. So it's really more about the forms of power that really determine the, the food choices in, in the household level. And so issues around class, identity differences, um, migrant statuses of people, all of these all inf inf influence that, that kind of scope. And this is very much linked to the structural power that we, we talked about earlier, but also even the social norms, which also is quite linked to the, to the discursive power in everyday lives. So <clears throat> basically what we are saying here is that we should not look at agri-nutrition in a very neutral kind of lens, but also realize that whichever interventions and whichever practices and research that we take it's important to look at how they actually take shape on the ground. And most of these are really influenced by the high level of corporate power and the dominance in international financial institutions, but also the roles in which, <clears throat> the ways in which household power dynamics and domestic power relations really shape the ways in which um, food choices are made and the ways in which um, the food system is organized. Thank you very much, Ajoa. So I'm picking up from where Ajoa left us. Uh, so we have a definition of power. Um, on the one hand, corporate power, and on the other hand, uh, power in everyday life. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to talk about next uh, is uh, how do we study power? How do we take account of power? And this is where political economy comes in as uh, um, an academic field of inquiry that is uh, very much concerned uh, with power. So could I get a sense, we are in a big room, and I'm addressing the people in the room now here in Lilongwe. How many people in the room are familiar with political economy? If you could put your hands up. Okay, not very many, which in a way is great, because hopefully what we have to say is going to be new for many of you. Um, so of course, there are many definitions of political economy that you could come across. Um, but I would say that, uh, generally speaking, political economy is uh, concerned with the study of uh, economic, social, and political realities uh, as uh, fundamentally interconnected. So, for example, I'm an economist, uh, and more specifically a political economist. Uh, and uh, from my perspective, uh, if I want to understand the functioning of uh, economic systems, uh, then uh, the best way to approach them is not to see them in isolation, but in fact, it's to, it's to understand how specific social relations uh, underpin, uh, shape, uh, and structure economic systems. Uh. So I would say that political economy is fundamentally concerned with uh, questions of distribution, of marginalization, and of exploitation. And political economy is uh, uh, therefore uh, intrinsically um, multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary. Uh, because it seeks to understand how history, culture, and customs uh, are dialectically related to an economic system and how, in turn, uh, political forces uh, shape economic interactions. So with this broader characterization in mind, uh, I'm moving to the next slide, if I can, yes. Um, so here we are in the field of uh, agrarian political economy, which is a branch of political economy that is concerned with studying processes of agrarian change or agrarian contexts more broadly. And uh, um, I'm drawing here on the work by an influential scholar in the field of agrarian political economy, who's Henry Bernstein. And he set out uh, um, four guiding questions uh, to take a political economy approach, which I think are quite useful. And these are the questions that you can see on the slide. Um, they're very simple. Who owns what? Who does what? Who gets what? And what do they do with it? So these questions can be applied at different levels of analysis, starting from the household level of analysis, but also going to the 
study of uh, national agri-food systems or even global agri-food systems. So, so they have uh, this uh, flexibility about uh, how they can be used. And they fundamentally draw our attention um, to the social conditions of production. So the relations uh, among people that underpin how agricultural production or in fact the production more generally in agrarian contexts uh, is organized. Um, they fundamentally indicate that a political economy analysis uh, should be aimed at uncovering, uh, to start with, uh, property relations, uh, who owns what, so that's the first question, but also the division of labor, who does what, um, the distribution of income and the fruits of labor more generally, who gets what, and then uh, the emerging organization of uh, consumption, of reproduction and accumulation, which is uh, uh, captured by the last question, what did they do with it? So here I want to open a parenthesis uh, that is very important, uh, which is uh, that uh, uh, mainstream or dominant uh, political economy approaches have been mostly concerned uh, with uh, studying uh, the social relations uh, that underpin the organization of uh, production and consumption particularly. Now, these uh, uh, perspectives uh, have been blind to something that instead uh, has been uncovered by feminist scholars, uh, uh, which is uh, reproduction or social reproduction. And uh, therefore, feminist scholars have offered uh, a very important corrective uh, to political economy, and this refers uh, to the broad field of feminist political economy, where reproduction or social reproduction uh, is considered to be another key dimension of uh, the organization of life uh, and something that is uh, um, fundamental uh, for the sustenance uh, and the maintenance of our societies. Um, so for those of you who might not be familiar with this, a basic definition of what, so what social reproduction is, is essentially all of the work, whether it is uh, paid or unpaid, and the material practices uh, that are needed uh, to reproduce uh, human life uh, and uh, relations uh, in our societies. So this includes uh, uh, things uh, such as housework and care, but also the provision of education, the provision of healthcare, the provision of basic infrastructure, and material practices uh, that, fundament that, for example, are used uh, uh, or are necessary in order to organize uh, ceremonies and rituals uh, as uh, um, uh, things uh, that are needed in order to maintain and reproduce uh, the fabric uh, of our societies. Um, so with this in mind, uh, I want to uh, think uh, in very practical terms uh, for those of you who might be thinking, okay, what do I do if I want to take a political economy approach uh, to the study of uh, uh, agriculture, food or nutrition? So I think a first step um, in a political economy approach to agri-food system and nutrition entails mapping uh, the elements that are represented on the slides. So first, the actors and their socioeconomic activities, uh, then their agency and relations, uh, the associated institutional dynamics, so which refer to policies and programs, uh, and also the underpinning socioeconomic and development visions or agendas, which sort of frame all of the above. Now, this mapping exercise is only a first step, as I've just mentioned, um, because then, of course, what we need is a theoretical framework that allows us to understand how these different elements connect to one another. Um, so for the study of agriculture and food, we have actually quite a few examples of theoretical frameworks in political economy. And just to name a few, I would say food regime analysis, which some of you might be familiar with, uh, the system of provision approach, uh, which is mostly concerned with understanding food consumption patterns, uh, and also the broad umbrella category of a feminist political economy of agrarian change. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through each of these uh, frameworks, uh, but you should know that uh, there is a technical brief uh, that our working group has put together and it will be published in the next uh, few weeks. Uh, um, so watch this space uh, because uh, those approaches are briefly sketched uh, in the technical brief. Uh, and in the brief, uh, we also provide uh, some suggested readings uh, for each of these political economy theoretical frameworks uh, that uh, you can have a look at if you want to um, find out more about this. Um, 
but uh, here I will say a few words uh, about uh, the feminist political economy of agrarian change uh, as a kind of theoretical uh, and methodological framework uh, that uh, we could use. Um, so, of course, uh, this is uh, a very extensive body of work, um, and I'm not going to provide a comprehensive summary here, but I do think that uh, we can essentially categorize uh, this field of study um, according to two main aims uh, that it has pursued. So on the one hand, uh, we have uh, uh, the feminist uh, uh, approaches uh, that have exposed uh, and documented the gender relations of power relevant uh, to agricultural production and the organization of life uh, in rural households in particular. So Ajo mentioned something already uh, to this effect earlier, but just I think this is an important point. So these, for example, are studies uh, that uh, have investigated uh, gender inequalities within households, uh, and therefore they have raised the question around uh, who owns resources within the household, uh, who has access to them, uh, and how this uh, uh, unequal allocation of resources uh, from a gender perspective uh, is associated with different outcomes uh, in terms of agricultural production, food security, and nutrition, among others. Uh, um, some of these scholarship has also looked at uh, the gendered nature of rural labor markets uh, and land markets, uh, for example. Um, so, in a slightly different uh, level of analysis of, from the household. Um, another part of the feminist political economy of agrarian change scholarship uh, has a bit of a different aim, uh, which I would say we could uh, define as broader. And uh, it is concerned with uh, understanding the articulations uh, between uh, social reproduction and capitalist production in agrarian contexts. So um, this scholarship, for example, has studied the trajectories of uh, capital accumulation and how these are linked to specific forms of household configurations, uh, specific forms of division of labor and associated well-being. Um, and here I want to add this point, which is that many of you probably um, know that uh, feminist scholarship uh, has traditionally been concerned uh, with gender inequalities. Um, but in response uh, to, I think, a powerful and important critique that has been put forward uh, particularly by black feminism, um, feminist scholarship is now increasingly concerned uh, with intersecting inequalities. Uh, and there is a plenary, I believe, tomorrow, which is on intersecting inequalities indeed in this conference. Uh, and this, in a way, means uh, understanding gender power relations uh, as being fundamentally interconnected with uh, power relations of class, of race, of ethnicity, of migration status, uh, and so on. Um, so with this in mind, uh, I want to uh, you know, close on my part uh, with a brief example, um, which comes uh, from research that I have been conducted, conducting in uh, a neighboring country for those of us who are here in Ilongwa today, um, which is about uh, uh, the cashew processing sector in Mozambique. And I want to use uh, the four guiding political economy questions uh, that I opened with uh, to briefly illustrate uh, how we could use them in practice uh, and uh, what elements uh, they can uncover. So if we look at this sector in Mozambique and we start uh, with uh, analysis of property relations, uh, then it is very clear that uh, the processing of cashinet when it's done uh, not informally but in factories, uh, um, although yeah, the distinction between formal and informal is a different story, but let's leave that on the side. Um, the factories uh, are owned by private investors, uh, very often uh, uh, foreign private investors, uh, and uh, the workers uh, are uh, mostly uh, from local areas or at most are migrant workers from within the country. Uh, so you have a first uh, important power relation of class there that uh, we need to consider. Uh, but something that is also interesting is that uh, workers, wage workers in these factories uh, very often uh, still own uh, their own land. So in a way, they're not only wage workers uh, because uh, they continue to practice farming. And this is important. I'll come back to this in just a second. In terms of the division of labor, so I'm looking at the second question here. 
it is very clear that work within the factories uh, is very much structured by ethnicity, by gender and education. So roles are allocated on this basis. And this interconnects with how responsibilities, reproductive responsibilities are distributed at home, are allocated at home, where these are uh, mostly allocated based on gender and age. Now, in terms of the distribution of income, so who gets what, it is very clear that in the cash reprocessing factories in Mozambique, women with the, low, uh, with the lower or lowest education get the lowest wages. Uh, and this is because of two reasons primarily. First, uh, these women are employed in roles uh, where they are paid based on production targets uh, that are very difficult to, met, uh, to meet. Uh, sorry. And therefore, uh, this uh, results uh, in lower salaries uh, at the end of the month. Uh, but second, uh, this is also because uh, women sometimes uh, have to skip work in the factory in order to take care of reproductive responsibilities at home. And so this is the important feminist insight uh, in terms of uh, seeing work uh, as, uh, in the factory and work at home as being fundamentally interconnected. And finally, in terms of what do they do with the income, so they um, use it, of course, uh, to sustain consumption. In the case of uh, very poor families, uh, often this happens via debt repayments. Uh, and uh, depending on uh, socioeconomic status and gender, they might be able, some workers, uh, to use uh, some parts of their income in order to finance other economic activities. Uh, so those who have land uh, might uh, be hiring occasional agricultural workers uh, in order to boost uh, their agricultural production. Okay, so this is very brief, of course, so there's a lot more to say, um, but I wanted to give this example. And just before I hand over to Sierra, um, I want to highlight how we have uh, these political economy frameworks when it comes uh, that we can draw on, and I think they're very useful when it comes to the study of uh, uh, agriculture and food. But I think that the same cannot be said for nutrition. So nutrition is uh, very often considered to be a biomedical or technical matter. And I think that uh, there is a lot of space uh, for those of us here to uncover how these uh, social relations uh, that we have been talking about uh, underpin uh, nutrition outcomes. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a bit of a reflection exercise uh, for all of you here and at home. Um, to consider whether you can address uh, these four basic uh, but very useful questions uh, for the topics or context that you're studying, or for those of you who are practitioners, uh, for the context uh, where you are designing an intervention or implementing an intervention, and what the implications of doing so are. Thank you. Over to Sierra. OK, um, so thank you for that. Uh, broad conceptual overview uh, and application of specific theoretical frameworks. So what we'll discuss now is how this is how these concepts and frameworks uh, can be applied or are being applied uh, to specific interventions or practice on the ground. So as we're going through a particular example of an intervention, Think to yourself, how can we ask these questions or apply these frameworks for either understanding an intervention, uh, making sense of how it's playing out, uh, or in designing them as well. So although this example of an intervention is based on an, an actual intervention from a particular place at a particular moment in time, uh, we didn't want to mention the specificity of it. This is based on something um, because we wanted to uh, demonstrate that this is fairly reflective of what is happening in current times. Uh, so the goal of this specific intervention uh, is to decrease stunting, wasting, uh, and underweight and anemia by 20% amongst women and children under the age of five uh, as a broad goal, but also to double incomes um, by 80% of particular sets of households. So the idea here is, not, is to broaden the understanding of agronutrition of a particular intervention uh, beyond just nutrition, but also livelihoods and incomes. So the issue of access is, is there. And that's fairly, I think, representative of many interventions ongoing. Uh, what's often also typical is that these targeted interventions are at all vulnerable women, uh, women's livelihoods, and their roles and responsibilities. So in thinking about uh, frameworks, uh, this is where I think a feminist political ecology, economy and ecology lens are particularly useful. 
The interventions that are typically used include uh, self-help and savings and loans groups, uh, capacity building or training to, to these vulnerable women for how to grow particular crops that are nutrient dense, or how to process them and prepare them for their households and their markets and their communities. So it's moving beyond just a capacity, um, but how to, to grow, but also how to use them. Uh, so there really is a focus across the food system in some ways. There's the building of infrastructure like latrines and hand washing stations because we understand that nutrition goes beyond what you consume, but how the body actually utilizes those nutrients. And then there's a governance, a good governance uh, component where we need to focus on addressing regional and local institutions uh, and services that are provided to households and, and people uh, so that they have the information and resources that they need. So what we see in some very progressive interventions happening uh, across the world is a multi-sectoral and multi-dimensional approach to agronutrition, which we think is very uh, worth continuing and progressing. So looking at these dimensions beyond just health and agriculture, but also water and sanitation, moving beyond just uh, outreach uh, and economic means, but also and biomedical, but also governance and many components. So when thinking about the questions that we originally asked around how to think about power, and dis there are three, three different types of power that we have been discussing in frameworks. So when you're looking at an intervention, when you're thinking about designing an intervention, how can we ask these questions of power to make sense of, of them? So on the question of discursive power, there's the question of in every intervention asking why is gender equality or equality more broadly, gender justice, women's empowerment, not necessarily a focus when so many of these interventions or so many uh, particular roles and responsibilities are targeted at women or vulnerable women. Not women as a focus, but thinking more broadly about gender and relations and intersecting relations. When looking at a particular intervention uh, or practice, how, what are the underlying assumptions about these gendered divisions of roles and responsibilities in relation to food and other care? And do they actually align with the lived everyday realities? Because what we're seeing is some, oftentimes gendered uh, analysis or the way an intervention is playing out is based on assumptions about what women and men do that aren't necessarily reflective of what people actually do and who does what. So there needs to be that uh, con social context uh, and that grounded reality to inform the wider process. And then how does the wider discourse of that project actually change people's behaviors, both in positive ways and in negative ways? So in this, when we're asking these questions, Sometimes we find in this, in this particular intervention, there were a number of unintended consequences. Because these questions were not asked around a broader set of power relations, the way it's playing out was based on a number of presumptions or assumptions, we, there were a number of un unintended consequences. And this is something we see oftentimes across interventions that target vulnerable people, particularly vulnerable women uh, and children, that uh, can often result in negative unintended consequences. So with the focus on increasing women's production uh, and their livelihoods to increase their income and the incomes of the household so that they can feed their families or provide more nutritious food to their markets, what usually tends to happen is these crops tend to be much more labor intensive. Uh, so for example, soy and sweet potato um, and that those intervention, that work that's created by these interventions are not redistributed uh, within the household or are double burdening, triple burdening uh, the targeted vulnerable women to begin with. And so we have to ask, what are the other household responsibilities, how they are playing out, and the way men are integrated into these uh, interventions as well and these so in this particular example, uh, men were not consulted. 
They were not uh, brought into the, the conversations about what their wives were doing uh, and then who will benefit from those activities as well. And as a result, uh, there was a backlash to women deciding how they wanted to use uh, the benefits of the intervention. And sometimes these, the backlash was violent. Uh, so just to read, read a quote, going back. Sorry about that. So one of the implementers of this particular intervention, who is an agricultural extension agent working with the self-help groups, uh, working to improve their livelihoods, help them manage their uh, self-help group and get their goods to the market, build their capacity, was a main point of focus within the community and broader institutions, uh, said to me in this intervention that we, so we supported them with soy, and when it was time for harvesting, the farmer called me saying, this soy, I'm going to seize it from the woman. You gave it to her and she does not respect me. I told them that this particular thing belongs to the household. And in this case, the woman who received the assistant viewed it as part of her own farming activities. And she decided to sell the harvest for cash, which can then result in a backlash from her husband and other household uh, members, other community members. So because there wasn't an accounting for the intra-household responsibilities, uh, an accounting or involving of men within the household, within the community about who does what and then who can benefit and who can decide from those benefits, it received a back to ask some of these questions in the interventions that you are uh, either helping to design or to, to evaluate, how can they be asked and and what could be the potential unintended consequences. Okay. Um, greetings everyone, and thank you for affording me the opportunity to present uh, before you this morning. So in addition to everything that my colleagues have shared this morning, uh, and in an attempt not to you know, repeat what has already been said, I think my particular investment uh, in this topic has to take on a particular justice lens, all right? Because ultimately, when we're talking about this idea of political economy, for me, it is about civic engagement, all right? Bearing in mind that when we're dealing with agriculture, nutrition, and health, food systems, transport, multi-pronged problems. So if it's about getting rid of assumptions, right? Understanding, I mean, we are all gathered here, you know, and we all have, we, we take a particular stance, particular postures to this issue, but at face value, right, where is this discussion located? All right, so when we're speaking about power, power in the food system, everybody claims that power seems to be the issue, but no one claims to have it. And as a result of that, I think we need to start then interrogating that mysticism and to say, what is it then that our research seeks to achieve and how do we ensure that this translates? What is important is that let us remember that for us as Africans in particular, we can have the rich, we can have the poor, but the idea of having hungry people in our midst is something very, very foreign to us. So how do we then ensure that that type of ethic emanates and is at the forefront of our scholarship to say that this is about life and death and there's a particular urgency that is needed in engaging with these matters. And so ultimately, let us then talk about the paradigms, right, that we all bring into the room, whether we're taking on a food sovereignty lens. Why is it that the idea of us, uh, you know, producing that uh, producing and consuming our own food problematic. We need to engage and interrogate that. Why? From a political economy lens. Let's talk about why the idea of food security, right, as a paradigm that has been the most dominant thus far, has become something of diminishing value, especially for us as activists. That's what we're looking at when we're talking about political economy, right? Let's talk about food justice. All right, where do we then locate all of this? How, what brings us together, right? How do we build consensus around agriculture, nutrition, and health con concerns in a way that then brings about this justice uh, story of ours? Um, yes, I will wrap it up there. Thank you, everybody.
Yeah, thank you very much indeed. So very clearly, not only an invitation to apply frameworks and questions, but indeed in the end, more of a challenge, perhaps even a call to action. And I think what is reflected here is not only the different experiences and disciplines coming together to develop this particular presentation, this collective of thinking, but also I think the clarity of positionality that each speaker came from. And I think if we engage with them, that will become very, very clear. So thank you. Hi, once again, everyone. So thank you all for being such a great audience. And I think, you know, just to wrap it up on the right note, so part of the key messages that we wanted to share with you this morning is simply that, you know, I think it's important that we all just take account, right, of this corporate power because it's often mystic, uh, you know, power is discursive like we had elaborated on earlier and how these power relations, you know, affect everyday life uh, in research and agriculture, food and nutrition. And then more important, I think it's also crucial that we reflect on how power relations, you know, in the processes that we are all involved in, right, in so far as this research goes, policy making, uh, and even our own activism, right, is about let's stay, let, let's always foreground those questions that we started off with. I think that should always be the point of departure, regardless of what silo, what sphere you find yourself in. And then lastly, I think it's also you know, simply a question of asking why, right? Why, why are we doing this work? What is my own investment in this work? And then to also, you know, be invested in world making, you know, in believing that things can change and the fact that we are creating something that is credible uh, and agri-food and nutrition systems research that will, you know, translate to just and nourishing food systems uh, for all. So thank you once again. And just to say that we have a technical brief uh, that we will be publishing soon. So please be on the lookout. And part of today's gathering was that, you know, we were also going to use this opportunity to further just fine tune, you know, where we find ourselves in so far as that right up goes. So all the commentary that was, you know, and the, and the inputs that were presented here today were really, really valuable and we'll be reflecting and retrospecting on that. So once again, thank you everybody for giving us this opportunity.